And then, very crucially, and this is the part that I know I always skip over, I think culturally we're conditioned to skip over, there's winter, and that's in the north. And that's the time when you turn inward, you stop the doing, you focus instead on being, uh, and you let the soil rest. And if you skip that part, which so many of us do, (laughs) the soil doesn't have a chance to regenerate, right? It it gets stripped. uh, And we all... I think, well, I won't generalize, but I know for, me, for myself it's true, and I know that for a lot of, a lot of creative folks, educators and, and other people who are doing work in the world, you know, when we skip that phase, we get stripped too. We get, de- de- you know, depleted. Welcome to The Conversation Factory. I'm your host, Daniel Stillman. Each episode, I'll talk to an amazing conversation designer to try and distill insights we can all bring into our work and lives. Human conversation is a material that can be shaped by design and shifting conversations in everyday meetings and organizations and yourself can create real change. And I hope to help you do it better and more authentically. I'd love to have you stay part of the conversation. Head over to theconversationfactory.com to sign up for my newsletter and never miss an episode. That's theconversationfactory.com. I'd also love for you to be part of the show. If there's a challenging transformation you're working through, head over to theconversationfactory.com, click coaching, and sign up for 30 minutes of free coaching that we might use on the show. Head over to theconversationfactory.com, hit coaching, and let me know what conversations you need help redesigning. Enjoy the episode. Today I talk with Kate Crawford the founding director of Arts Integration and Culture at City School of the Arts. This conversation with Kate was a rich and wonderful surprise. I found her Four Seasons framework somewhere in the corners of the internet and was immediately enchanted by it. Spring, summer, fall, and winter as metaphors for the flow of work. The framework is so powerful in the types of conversations it allows into the larger conversation about work especially winter, a time to reflect and consider, to heal and incubate. It's rare to make space for that type of work. The opening and closing circles Kate hosts in her school to bookend the week, it touched my heart. And it's such a beautiful way to work and so similar to how Daniel Mezik gets organizations to shift how they work through open space agility. Check that episode out, linked in the show notes. It's really kind of a shocking parallel. This conversation has started to open up the idea of threads and threading in conversation design for me. I first got the sense of threading from my conversation with Nandini Stalker, Google's head of conversation design advocacy. As I see it now, the arc of a conversation is made of stories. And the way Kate describes our stories is coming together to make a new one, using the word braiding makes so much sense. Conversations are the exchange of stories. And placing ourselves and others into the hero role, shifting perspective as empathy and generosity demands is the flow of real dialogue. Finally, we talked about how creative work requires an audience. An audience provides a pull and a push for work. At least that's the way I experience it. Even when I don't feel like it, I push myself to finish work on an episode because I know people are waiting or pulling for it. And there's the loop of feedback on the work. People write to tell me what was great and where I missed the mark. That's one of the reasons that I feel the conversation between an organization and its customers is one of the most critical missing pieces in companies that struggle with a sluggish work cadence. There's not enough urgency. If you want to dig into that conversation more, check into the episodes from Ray Wang, director of the Dorm Room Fund, and Sarah Mitchell, design lead at Faraday Futures. Both help me see principles at work in sustaining great conversations with customers and community. Thanks so much for listening, and I hope you enjoy the episode as much as I did making it. Thank you for making the time. I'm going to like officially welcome you to the Conversation Factory, and I honestly can't remember how I originally found the your natural cycles model but I did and it's lovely and we connected on Twitter and now here we are in in real time talking about it here we are and actually I did a little sleuthing seems ominous not sleuthing just a little 
a little uh, creative investigating and realized that we actually have uh, a friend in common, Jin Chu. Huh. And what that means uh, is that I actually owe you a debt of gratitude. Um, so thank you. And I'm going to tell you why I'm thanking you. Because Jim Chu, uh, as you well know, created a, a pop-up community art space out of a bodega that had been destroyed by Sandy. Specials a on Sea. called Specials on Sea, yes. Ah. And Specials on Sea, it turns out, is where we held uh, our very, very first community meeting as we were first envisioning what is now our school. Uh, and only two community members came to that meeting. It was our team of educators who had this wild, crazy idea for a school, and Jim, who was one of our very, very first... Oh, wait, is this the school that Jim's been working on all this time? Yes. <laughs> no idea. Yes. Wow. That's hilarious. So in, in conversation design, we talk about threads, right? You know, threads that connect. Mm. And this is just a wonderful long thread. So I don't know if you know this, but my 3D printed men's accessories company backed specials i do know that yeah, now that's so <laughs> isn't that funny jim said jim used to own the restaurant that my friends would frequent every sunday night since 2010 it closed down mm. a bunch of years ago and that's yeah. a long thread connecting our lives and yeah. and jim said you know there's this space and we were like that sounds like a fun thing to do let's pay for the insurance right? and see what we can do with it <laughs> Well, thank you, because that became literally the launch point of our school. If we trace back, sort of when did our school go from, and this is in my, my memory, you know, my colleagues might have a, a different inflection point. But if you were to ask me to pinpoint the moment in which our school went from an amorphous, crazy idea in three people's heads to an actual living, breathing organism that would grow and expand to you know, become a community of young people and educators and families and artists and thinkers and visionaries. Uh, that was the moment sitting in that converted bodega space with Jin Chu and, uh, and our little team and some of our former students and then two community members who both, interestingly enough, are now full-time employees of our school. That is amazing. <laughs> and just let that wash. Is that funny over how me. the world works. It is funny how the world works. So yeah. I, I want to talk about. I'm going to lay out this framework because I I think we can use it as like as an analogy for everything we're doing right now. Because right now right. we're like we're reflecting and well we're expressing joy. We're celebrating the harvest of <laughs> where we've gotten yeah, to. Oh yeah. So I, I'm going to put this up when you know when, so people can look at this the way we're looking at it. But it's a nice little wheel and it's beautifully painted and it and it's a four phase. Uh, framework. Actually, maybe maybe you could talk through it. I don't know if you can do it without a picture in front of you. Sure, you yeah, of course. In your brain. Oh, of course. I do, I do. Well, it's become really a touchstone for me, um, not just as an educator, but honestly, in terms of my own creative life, my own process uh, as, a, as a creative human in the world, and also as a mother, and, you know, in all the different kind of roles that I inhabit. Uh, it's been so useful um, in a really concrete way. So I'm happy to, I'm happy to kind of lay it out. Um, I also wanted to say at the outset that this was a model um, or a framework that was introduced to me initially by a student hmm. of mine. Um, and I, I think that that's important to share because I think one of yeah. the things that I, uh, I gravitate toward uh, most about this, this way of working is that it's so non-hierarchical. It's got its own natural intelligence. That's so simple um, that it, it, it's a, it's a real leveler, um, and so people can come to it from all different sort of areas of expertise and uh, experience, and it's, it's, it's just been a kind of a remarkable thing. And so mm. um, his name is Chris Moncrief, and I always just really like to, to give him a, a shout-out and, and to credit him for introducing me to this model. That's um, awesome. So it's really, it's really simple. If you think about uh, kind of a compass where there's you know, north, south, west, east, the compass corresponds to the four seasons. And so winter is in the north and spring is in the east um, when the sun rises. The summer is in the south and the fall or the harvest um, time is in the west where the sun sets. Um, and so the sort of orientation of a typical cycle starts in spring and that's a time of planting seeds. And so if you think about it as a, you know, a way of organizing a project, that's the time 
where you're asking big questions, where you're allowing your imagination to really run wild. It's a very kind of like sparkly, generative time. You're not shutting down any ideas. You're really open to possibility. It tends to be a very energizing time. And, uh, uh, and so that's the spring, you know, sort of the, the, the moment of the, the sun coming up um, and the start, the launch of a project. Mm. And then you move into summertime, and that's symbolized by tending the crops. You're tilling the fields, you're weeding, you're mulching, and it's dirty and it's gritty. And that's a period of real sustained work and persistence. And what's tricky about summer is that it's hot, it's sweaty, uh, it's sometimes uncomfortable, and you have to stay vigilantly focused on what it is that you're doing. You're really building your craft during that time. You're really, you're really going in and, and, and uh, just doing the work. Um, and it can be sometimes frustrating because you don't really have much to show for it in the summertime. Nothing's really come up out of the ground so much yet in terms of fruit or you know, anything that you might harvest or point to as a product. You're just in the, you're in the thick of it. Uh, and you have to persist there if you want to get to the harvest. And so then that comes in the fall. That's the, the West orientation. And in the fall, if you've done your work, uh, hopefully you have something to harvest. You've got a fruit on your tree or you've got, you know, an ear of corn on your stock. And so you pick it and you gather your friends at your metaphorical table and you say, hey, I made a plum or I made a ear of corn or I made this project or I made this lab report or I made this design prototype or whatever. Um, and you hit pause for a second and celebrate it. You say, oh my gosh, I made a thing. And even if it's not perfect, you kind of carve out that space to really just enjoy it and, you know, really kind of... Uh, bask in the in, in, in what you've accomplished, enjoy the fruits of your labor. Uh, and then very crucially, and this is the part that uh, I know I always skip over, I think culturally we're conditioned to skip over, there's winter and that's in the north. And that's the time when you turn inward, you stop the doing, you focus instead on being, uh, and you let the soil rest. And if you skip that part, which so many of us do, <laughs> The soil doesn't have a chance to regenerate, right? It, it gets stripped. Uh, and we all, I think, well, I won't generalize, but I know for, me, for myself it's true, and I know that for a lot of, a lot of creative folks, educators and, and other people who are doing work in the world, you know, when we skip that phase, we get stripped too. We get, de de, you know, depleted. Mm. Um, we don't let our soil regenerate. Uh, and we go straight back into spring. In fact, most of us, it's spring, we go straight back into summer. We get back on the grind. Maybe we even just stay in summer all the time, you know, kind of in that linear forced march towards some final product. And so that winter time, I think, is really, really crucial, and it's very hard to carve out time for, it, but it's really important. Yeah, it sure is. And and honestly, the winter was, I think, one of the first things that sort of struck me about this this model of creativity that's really lacking in most in most models that that I have used in my own mm. work and that sort of need to go backstage and replenish and refresh is like absolutely mm. absolutely critical yeah you know it's so interesting i was actually talking to somebody um last night uh i think i mentioned that i was going to speak to you and and so she she asked about the model. We're talking about it a little bit, and she said, "You know, it's so funny. I think that for me, winter time is actually it actually takes place during the summer." And I laughed and I said, "You know, it's it's kind of remarkable, but there's a real structural reason for that, and that's that you know, so many of us, whether or not we're educators, um, we work on we work on a school model, right? We think about mm. summertime as a time of vacation. And the reason for that is very structural and it's tied to, it's tied to agriculture that, you know, when, when um, uh, compulsory education first became a thing in the United States, the kids were a labor force, right? They were really needed to work the fields in the summertime. So they didn't go to school during the summertime because they had to be out there tending the crops physically, right? Yeah. And in the wintertime, there was nothing to do because there was snow covering a lot of the country. So <laughs> they went to school. <laughs> to school. And so there's a real reason why, you know, for those of us who are in education and we have this, this pause point over the summer, that actually does become our metaphorical winter, our time, if we choose to, you know, to turn inward and reflect and say, hey, how did this year go? what went well, what didn't go well, how do I want to shift my practice next year? So it's kind of funny. It's ironic, I guess, yeah. that there's that inverse relationship really seasonally, but that's for a real good reason. Totally. So you talked a little bit about this, um, this moment that the seed maybe took root for the school that you started. Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk a little yeah. bit about when the, where the seed came from and what it's, uh, 
what it's grown into, what you're harvesting now with the New York City mm. Charter School of the Arts? Sure. Just let people know what that is, since they may not know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it's a mouthful. We call, it, we call it City School of the Arts, or CSA for short. Yeah, I, and I would say at the outset, you know, that that, that that moment of the seed taking root, I think is really different for all of the various people involved in this. And I, and I want to name that at the outset. This has been a really collaborative journey. And so there are three co-founders but then beyond that, there are a lot of other team members who, from the start, have really helped shape the, the vision here. And I think if you ask any one of those people about that, um, that, that moment that their seed took root, you know, each one of those people would have a very different answer. Actually, can I put a pause on that? before? We, I want to get into your, that story, but that is such sure. an interesting idea that I've been playing with as well, that like, you know, we're all the hero in our own story. Right. But we are just an actor in many other people's stories. And mm. this idea that somehow at some point you all came together and now you're in each other's story and you're you're locking your cycles are now in sync somehow. And mm. so maybe and I and maybe mm. this is hard to do, but it would be interesting to just think about like how did how did you guys go from that that moment of everyone was on their own journey up to this point and now you're on a journey together, <laughs> which is really like right. Everyone else had their own scale, and that's something I'd also love for you to talk about because you said this: the cycles can work as they do on a day scale or an hour scale or a lifetime scale. And, right. and so it's right. We're, we're talking about a lot of things here, but it's such an interesting thing to talk <laughs> about this moment when you all came together in that room and said, "Let's do a thing." Yeah, I'm sure that wasn't like, "Oh, now it's let's go do it. Let's cut to the montage." You know what I mean? Like that's not. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and the hip-hop soundtrack kicks in. Totally. Yes. They're painting mm-hmm. walls. Right, right. There's a lot of shots of us on the subway with a light flashing in our faces <laughs> and sort of like seriously scribbling in our notebooks and stuff. Yeah, exactly. Well, that's the, that's, the, that's the movie in my mind. Yeah, 100%. Right, right. Yeah, no, I think that that's, I think that that's really a, a beautiful way to think about it, and I kind of see it as you're, as you're describing it almost as a braiding together of yes, different yes. narratives, you know. So... You know, I can't pretend that I know the the stories in which my colleagues are the heroes. You know that that would be on, uh, you know that that would be their their story to tell. Um, but I do think that there's something powerful um, in that moment that you realize that your story is overlapping and locking into somebody else's story uh, because you share certain real core beliefs that you're willing to. Um, put a lot of sweat into <laughs> you're willing to get in the get in that summer grind with with folks um and really walk in with them and 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 become sort of life partners in a big cycle of work and so the the sort of backstory um for the three of us coming together is that the two of us my colleague Jeffrey and I Jeffrey's a pianist um an, an exceptional music educator uh so he and I uh, worked for many many years at a school in the Bronx called Bronx Prep um, and we, with the help of a lot of other colleagues, put together a really thriving performing arts program. And uh, that existed in the context of a school that was set up a bit more traditionally. Um, and yet within that particular program, uh, the, the, the model that we sort of developed organically was very much student-led. It was intergenerational. The kids in that school ranged from fifth grade to 12th grade. Um, and so you know, by the time, you know, Jeffrey and I were there together, we overlapped for 10 full years. And so by the time we left, we were, we had really kind of honed a, um, a way of working that was, that was really essentially student led, you know, older kids mentoring younger kids. Um, and, and we really saw what was possible when students were in the, were in the driver's seat of their own education. Mm. And when learning is embodied as, as it is, you know, in the arts, um, and when the product of learning or the point of learning is about connecting very authentically with a real audience, it's not about just, you know, sitting back answers on an exam. It's about making something collaboratively that is meant to be shared. And you will know if it is working because the audience is sitting right there in real time. Mm. Um, and so that creates a very different context for learning. And we were really excited by the possibilities of that. Um, and we were also, you know, we, we there was a tension um, in terms of how far we could push that model and how deeply we could expand that model within the context of a school, which um, for all its strengths wasn't necessarily set up 
uh, in that way. Mm-hmm. And um, as we were kind of wrestling with those big ideas, um, a woman uh, came on board at, at our school um, named Jamie Davidson, um, whose background was in uh, in literacy work. She had just um, gotten her master's degree at, uh, at Harvard and um, and came in with some really wonderful ideas about building community and, and, and boosting sort of academic efficacy in the classroom, but through this really um, rich student, student-centered student model. Um, and so she saw what we were doing and we saw what she was doing. And there was this really wonderful kind of moment of kismet of this mutual recognition of like, oh, wow, we're really on the same page here. Um, and there were some shifts in our school's administration, which sort of created a bit of a catalyst, although I think the, the sort of set, the collaborative spirit was sort of already in motion. But when that shift happened, we gathered up, uh, Jamie and Jeffrey had the initial conversation and then they gave me a call. Um, and I remember vividly sort of even where I was sitting you know, in my kid's playroom. I had sort of just had a, a, my third child and was in this sort of moment of wondering where my own creative and professional path was going to lead. And they called me up and said, we have to start an arts-based school. Mm. And I said, oh my God, yeah, you're right, we do. Um, and we were just off to the races. Uh, and it, just, uh, it was fast and furious. We, you know, we, we had to figure out how to do this thing, um, which was the steepest learning curve that I've ever been on in any of the spaces that I've ever worked in in my life. Um, it was super humbling. Uh, and it took a while, you know, for us to, to, to put the planning together and gather the team and, you know, lay things out and, and get clear on what is our, what is our focus? What is our laser beam ethos? Um, what are we drilling down into and what do we want to create? And so all of that, all of that happens through conversation. I mean, and I'm not just saying that because yeah. <laughs> that's your area of focus, but truly it was, it was, it was the three of us in a room for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours, and hours talking. You, you know, it's just amazing because there's so many things that are there where you, for a while, you guys are working in a system and you're trying to change that system. And then there's this moment when you say, let's create a new system. Mm. Right. And there's this, this, that moment when you, when you plant that seed and you're, and you said, look, we're going to put arts at the core of this school. Yeah. And how is an art school, how is the conversation about education different with arts at the core than without arts at the mm-hmm. core? Why is it important to talk about education with arts at the core? It's a great question. It's a great question. So I think that there's a lot of ways into this. There's a lot of answers to it. For me personally, creativity is at the heart of great work, period full stop. And I don't think that the way that our education system has evolved has put enough, um, has put enough emphasis there. Um, oftentimes we fall into a dichotomous way of thinking about creativity. Um, we think about sort of content and rigor and learning skills and facts and, um, you know, kind of demonstrating academic mastery as one thing on one side of a spectrum. And then we see creativity and self-expression and the arts on the other side of that spectrum. And I think that when you look at people who are truly doing innovative work in the world, people who are change makers at the top of their game, whether they're in medicine or uh, they're historians or they're uh, coders or they're whatever, choreographers even, whatever, whatever their medium is, where they're doing work that's pushing the envelope and, and moving us where we need to go as a culture, those, those people have found a sweet spot between, if we want to say rigor and creativity, um, that, that is, that's so powerful. And, and I think that when schools are working and thrumming and thriving, it's because, in their own way, they've found the, their system that they've that, they, that they've established. Um, their community has found that sweet spot, and you can des- describe it in so many different ways. Whether it's the sweet spot between structure and freedom, whether it's the street, sweet spot between you know um, academic rigor and and creative expression, um, I think that those those sort of two sides of the coin not only are they both necessary, but they're actually when you find the synergy, they're they're mutually 
supportive of one another than necessary. And so I think when we talk about putting art at the core, what we're really talking about is putting putting creative process uh, at the core and 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 helping helping kids learn to think like artists so that ultimately they think like change makers. Mm. That's wonderful. One thing you said earlier where you talked about student-led learning mm. where they have an audience and they get this real-time feedback. Yeah. I think one of the things, certainly in my own work, is it's very easy for our conversations to become theoretical. Mm-hmm. And when you have this idea of putting something out into the world and getting feedback and actually having an audience, then yeah. it's... Um, then there's this there's there's pressure in a good way right you you have to put something yeah, out there and yeah. you see does it work and it's very easy to see that in in a performance um with with design or creativity there's this temptation to hold on to something for a really long time before you mm. release it and so i think right. definitely teaching kids to like be generative and to work with, right. with the community that's that's so critical yeah, and it requires so much courage, right? It really, it, it, it requires students to build that resilience, that muscle. And this is something that I personally did not learn early on. I mean, this is something that I, I'm, I'm working on as an adult. But the courage to say, hey, I made a thing. It's not quite done yet. It's not perfect. I haven't honed it. It's, it's a raw, living, messy thing. And I'm going to expose myself and show it and allow myself to be vulnerable and and welcome in your thoughts and your feedback um, because I trust you. And so that's there's this other part of it that so these are sort of like things that um, even if you don't specifically set out to to, to teach courage, like oh today mm. on our lesson plan we are teaching courage and resilience, right? But if you set up a system in which students are uh, encouraged, where the expectation is that they're going to make work that is going to be messy, they are going to share that work with one another in a way that is safe enough for them to get feedback from each other that's actionable, that will help them hone their thing that they're working on, and they'll do it again, and they'll do it again, and they'll do it again. If that's the system that you're building, it requires kids and grownups, frankly, to learn courage, and it requires them to learn resilience, and it requires them to be okay uh, with their own vulnerability, not only be okay, but seek it out, like heat seeking missiles, you know, like knowing that, okay, if I'm feeling a little shaky right now, that's a really good sign. That means I'm onto something. Um, and so I think, you know, there's so many, there's so much external pressure on kids to shy and, and grownups too, of course, um, in this culture to shy away from that shaky, vulnerable feeling. Mm. Um, we just want to stamp that out. Like, <laughs> or especially in middle school, it's like, yeah. oh God, that's the worst feeling in the world, right? Yeah. Um, and so there's something I think quite radical about saying, no, 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 that is the litmus test. If you're feeling that and you're, and you're willing to kind of inch toward it, that, that's, a, that's a great sign. You want that. Um, and so that's, that becomes a byproduct of this way of working. I think that's pretty powerful. So how did that, how can we map that to the creation of, of the school because you, you it started with mm. this internal idea and then it, it you you guys the the founding team has shared it with each other and then you created a mm-hmm. you know uh, a living prototype that I I imagine the conversation uh, about what the school is and what it should be and how it should evolve that's that's a continue I mean how many years has this been going on now just only one. Yeah, we yeah we just started talking about the iterative design process right so we are now in. Um, Again, ironically, we're it's summertime, but we're in winter. We're in our, our team. If we don't have students in the building, so we're gathering in, we're turning inward, we're 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 sitting with our with our plans, we're reviewing, we're saying what worked, what didn't work. You know, we're about to launch into spring phase for year two and plant those seeds for this next iteration and think about okay, what you know, what do what works beautifully that we want to build on and really expand? What do we just need to throw out the window? It seems like a great idea on paper. Then we got 106 graders in the space, and oh my god, that doesn't work at all, you know. Um, and so much of that you can't know until you're in it. Um, and so we're in it. We're now about to launch into year two. Um, and so you know, you were talking, you you referenced earlier about the fact that these that this cycle um, it nests in in kind of um, uh, it, it, it uh, scales, if you will, right? Mm. So, you know, in the in the in the course of my life, if you want to like look, if we zoom way, way, way out, 
I'm in summer of my life, right? Yeah. right? Like in terms of being a professional person, like I'm in the weeds, I'm in the thick of it. But if we zoom in, we're in the, we're in the winter time of this particular cycle of, a, you know, an annual, mm. um, the, the, the annual cycle of our, of our school year. We're about to start spring of, um, of this next year. And then the school year itself will be, you know, summer in the, in the, in the toward the end of the school year where we're doing all of our culminating activities, you know, where we put on our big spring musical, where we, you know, the, the, the kids display their visual art portfolio, they do their big piano recital, they're defending thesis, uh, you know, projects in humanities, whatever they're doing in science, their, their big culminating activity in math, all that stuff kind of happens towards the end of the school year. So that's the harvest, mm-hmm. which again, inversely happens in the springtime in the school. So I, I don't know if that's clear, but, um, you know, and then of course you can telescope in further, you know, the course of a meeting yeah. can, can, can take place or the, the, the course of a lesson plan. We actually use the season wheel as our uh, template for, for lesson plans and unit plans. Um, and so it sort of telescopes in and telescopes out. How does that work? Like, what is the, what is the effect of that, the season's wheel on just like a staff meeting? Yeah, it's a great question. Well, you know, in a perfect world, and of course, meetings are messy. Humans are messy. So mm. this is a, you know, it's a starting point. It's a framework. And then who knows? We could go down the rabbit hole because we just like have to figure out how to, you know, move that group of 52 sixth graders from one end of the hallway to the other without creating a traffic jam. So, you know, the, like yeah. <laughs> real life intervenes. And, and sometimes things things just you know, organically kind of take, take on their own um, momentum and, and, and take us out of that cycle. But, but, you know, in a, in a, in an ideal situation, a meeting starts, you gather in. Um, and I think oftentimes meetings make them, you know, when, when people are facilitating meetings, they'll make the mistake of just, just diving straight into the summertime, right? Driving, driving straight into the work yes. uh, without yeah. any kind of orientation, without any kind of opening move, without any kind of like, let's make eye contact and, say each other's names out loud Mm. and greet one another and remind each other, you know, even if it's just the simplicity of, you know, let's whip around the room. Everyone say in one sentence, one great thing that you witnessed happening with with kids today. You know, it takes four minutes to do that. And yet when you do, when you make the time to be in that spring, that's the spring, the planting of the seeds, right? That sort of generative kind of opening move. Suddenly every voice is in the room everyone's had a moment to hit pause, reflect for just a second and like bring up something that feels inspiring. And yeah. that spring energy of being inspired sets the tone for a meeting that's really different than if it's like, okay, we're here, we're meeting, okay, look, we got to figure out, we got to solve this problem. Let's go, like, what's your idea? What's my idea, right? If you, when you do that, I think it can be really, um, it can be super jarring and yeah. it can be deflating too. Yeah. Like you're like, oh my God, I just taught a whole day. Now I'm going to go to this meeting. Yeah, I feel Ugh. like getting shot out of a cannon, like that feeling of just like... Yeah, it sucks. Out. <laughs> you know, it's funny because if you take a step back, sometimes uh, in my own facilitation work, actually going into the, like starting with resting the soil because they people mm. like because people have been shot out of a cannon the whole day, they come yeah. into the room... And then there's this, this moment, and you can see great facilitators do that, where they say, okay, everyone, like, let's leave behind wherever we were, or mm-hmm. in a way, that sort of, that sort of, hey, how's everyone doing? Yeah. Uh, what's a good thing you saw today? That's, that's getting them to express some joy and reflect and just be like, okay, now what are we here to do today? Right, it's, right. It's just pushing backwards a little bit. In my creative model, it's, oh, you have to, you have to open before you close, right? You want to generate right. before you right. narrow down. But right. before you can open, you have to like decide, you have to close on what you are going to yeah. open on. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I was, yeah, that's well said. Yeah. Well, thank you. <laughs> I was literally just talking to a student <laughs> who, um, a group of um, college students who are trying to learn design thinking. And he had, Notice this challenge of communication between some of the parties in in the he's doing a summer internship, and he's like, "Man, my supervisor saw it too, and we're thinking we should how should I best uh, facilitate a meeting to have everyone talk about better communication between all these people and all these departments?" And I said, "Well, does everyone see the problem?" Mm. And and because if you bring everyone to a meeting to say, "Hey, let's solve this communications problem," maybe everyone doesn't actually see it as a problem. Sure. 
I was like, you can't really invite people to a, a, a into a room to share a problem that they don't that they don't see and they don't share. And it's like you right. have to make sure that you, if you invite them into this room, that they all are there for the same reason. And that's yeah, that's a real yeah. a real thing. Yeah, it is. absolutely. So <laughs> you talked a little bit about um, community. Yeah, I'm wondering how we've talked about the seasons model with team conversations. Um, mapping it to your own like personal journey and making time mm. for your own personal reflection. How do you use it or do you use it or can you use it to like work with your community? Yeah, absolutely. So in a very, very concrete way, um, we, we think about the week in terms of the season wheel. So when we start on Monday morning, we have an opening community circle. Um, and we gather together, and that's that spring moment, that sort of generative space of looking ahead to you know what 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 kind of seeds are we planting for the week? What's I mean, just in a concrete way, like literally what's on deck, you know, what is going to happen? Mm. But in a more um, you know a more kind of expansive or creative way, also trying to uh, use a piece of art, whether it's a poem or a piece of music um, or a, you know a, a line from a speech, maybe to to set a tone for the week mm. and kind of give ourselves a sense of coherence um, and uh, and increasingly we're working on bringing students into that process so they can begin to facilitate those opening circles um, and and go from their own lives and their own creative wells you know what's important to them to name yeah. for the week as you know sort of a group or community intention um, and we try to be really responsive to what's happening, both in terms of the community itself, what's happening, you know, we're, this is middle school. So there's a lot of dynamics. Mm. There's a lot of, you know, kids are changing. We're an intentionally diverse school. And so there's a lot going on. And then, of course, you know, in terms of the outside world, we're doing this at a time that, you know, there's just such, we're in a pressure cooker mm. um, in terms of what's happening politically right now. Um, and again, as an intentionally diverse school, you know, what it, what it means for sixth graders to be really deep diving into into issues of race and gender and language and power, you know, at this moment in history is really, really intense. And so we use those opening circles to name some of that. And we, we try to do that in a way that's grounded in the arts so that it feels uh, coherent with our with our mission and with our, with our focus. And then the course of the week unfolds, and that's the summertime. That's when we're doing our work, um, you know, academically, artistically, socio-emotionally, we're, we're in it. And then on Friday afternoons, we gather for a closing community circle. And we uh, the, the, the format for that is always basically the same, although there's different elements. Sometimes we have, you know, guests who come and, and present things. But generally, we showcase the work that's happened over the course of the week. And so... We have a little slideshow and they're just images, you know, photographs that we've gathered. Um, teachers just snap quick snapshots of what's happening in their classrooms. Um, and we make sure that we have something um, that represents the work that's happening in the various academic and artistic subject areas. And then we have students just stand and, uh, and speak on what they've created. And often those things are works in progress. So it's not, it's, you know, it's a harvest, but it's a, it's a mini harvest. Yeah. Um, they can say, you know, in, in humanities, we've been working on these, you know, where we were doing a Socratic seminar about uh, immigration. And we, you know, so they, they sort of stand up and, and that's a very fluid process. The kids now are really attuned to that, to that way of um, uh, harvesting with one another and kind of just acknowledging the work that they've, that they've done. And then when we close out and, we all sort of prepare to go on our way. It's with that intention of using the weekend to, to go into winter, you know, to in whatever ways are appropriate for each one of us, which of course are different. You know, everybody's got their own way to do that, but really kind of setting the tone that, all right, we've, we've, we've done this week's worth of work. We've, we've harvested the fruits of those labors and now we're going to take a little breather and go off to our corners and let some of that sink in and be in a, a different kind of headspace. And then we'll, See you back on Monday. I can't. I have to say, like, I that is goddamn beautiful. Like, that is just like really <laughs> like having that opening and closing circle. Is, I mean, it's funny in the world of adult work when you talk about agile and scrum ways of working, there are these ceremonies that try and create cadence yeah. and rhythm. And I can only imagine how much um, coherence is the word you use, how much coherence that would give to the week for the kids. 
Hey, this is Daniel. We're about the halfway point, so this is a great time for you to get up, stretch your legs, get some popcorn, fill up your soda. If you're in the car, stay focused. If you have your hands free, this is also a great moment to head over to theconversationfactory.com to sign up for the newsletter. I send out more detailed write-ups, insights, and tools from these conversations, and I'd love to share them with you. So head over to theconversationfactory.com and stay in the loop. How did you come to, I mean, that is such a wonderful design for a week. Like, how did you guys come <laughs> to that as, as, a, as your pattern? I mean, really from this season wheel model, we, we really gave a lot of thought to, you know, I think the, 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 the X that we were solving for was a feeling that we each had had in different ways um, and that we had witnessed our students really grappling with and other teachers that we worked with really grappling with, which was this idea of fragmentation in school, uh, a kind of a sense of being kind of like constantly moving from, okay, you know, 10 o'clock, so we're in English class and then we run the math class and then we go to after school and we try to put on a play and then we go to the, you know, and we're kind of like racing from one way of thinking to another way of thinking. Uh, and, and all of that is just sort of, we just keep doing that over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. Mm. And there's not really a sense of, I love that word cadence. Um, that's a really, really nice way to describe it, I think. And so I, I, I was just sensing that fragmentation in my own lived experience of school. It was true for me as a student. Um, and I really craved moments of stillness and I craved moments of reflection and I craved moments of just kind of like taking stock of like, where, where have we been? Where are we going? And so when it came down to the nuts and bolts of, okay, we have to design a schedule, <laughs> no one's handing us anything, you know? Mm. And so we get to decide how we want this to feel and look. Uh, and so it was a really intentional decision of how could we make Monday feel like spring and how could we make Friday feel like fall? Mm. And it's not perfect. You know, I mean, I think that, that, um, I think it's really worth saying too, that there, there are, there are Fridays where we're starting a project, you know, sure. because that's how the week worked out because there was a snow day or there was a, or, you know, it was just a, a every, every teacher has a different process. And so, you know, I, I want to be careful of not tying too neat a bow on this mm. because it, it, you know, school is messy and it's okay for that to, to be the case. And, um, sometimes things take longer than you think, uh, you know, we're, we're, uh, we're constantly, differentiating for kids who are coming in with a huge array of different skill sets and experience levels and abilities and interests. So you never quite know exactly how, how, you know, you make a map and you try to follow it and then things change. Yes. So it's never, it's never, it's never perfectly aligned. Um, and that's okay. Yeah. I mean, my mother always says the territory is not the map. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Nevertheless, it's you need a map. The menu is not the meal. <laughs> <laughs> That's also yeah. true. <laughs> yeah. Well, look, you know, I'm looking at at some text that you had put to this to this to this map, where we, you actually say it gives teachers and learners across disciplines a simple but powerful way to infuse their work with a strong sense of rhythm, purpose, and meaning. And I feel like, in a way, the seasonality must give you this sense of, well, this is the natural order, and that seems comforting. Right. It is. It's very grounding. You know, it's funny. So I, I, uh, I love how threads, or you talked about threads really at the beginning and just like how the threads of, of, of life have these really weird ways of sort of interweaving. And I, I came across Mary Oliver quote, um, which I wrote down in a notebook in 2004 and I just, no, 2005. And I just found it again a couple of days ago. And then I happened to see a, a, Mary Oliver, um, snippet, I guess, of Wild Geese, right? Yeah, we your, welcome all website. Mary Oliver quotes on yes. this podcast. Yes, yes. I mean, she's, she's so extraordinary. She she has this incredible way of making you think that she's talking about turtles and mud and lily pads, and all of a sudden she, she goes and unlocks your life in some way that makes you visible to yourself in some way you'd never imagined. Yes. Like, Mary, really? Really, Mary? <laughs> My goodness. Anyway, so I, 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 I wrote down this snippet of her book, um, Blue Pastures, so now, what's that, 12 years ago, and then forgot about it, and then found it again 
And uh, if you'll indulge me, I want to read it to you because I think, you know, what you're talking about in terms of that, that form, there's a, there's a line in here. Yes, it's a please. Short, it's a short little snippet, but there's a line in here that um, talks about a shapely heat retaining form that I just, and I, I think that that line is so beautiful. So I'll read, I'll read you the passage so you have some context. Um, she says, I don't mean it's easy or assured. There are the stubborn stumps of shame, grief that remains unsolvable after all the years, a bag of stones that goes with one wherever one goes, and however the hour may call for dancing and for light feet. But there is also the summoning world, the admirable energies of the world, better than anger, better than bitterness, and because more interesting, more alleviating. And there is the thing one does, the needle one plies, the work. And within that work, a chance to take thoughts that are hot and formless and to place them slowly and with meticulous effort into some shapely heat-retaining form, even as the gods or nature or the soundless wheels of time have made forms all across the soft, curved universe. That is to say, having chosen to claim my life, I've made for myself, out of work and love, a handsome life. <laughs> <laughs> so to come across this after all those years and see that there's so many little touchstones here, the soundless wheels of time, this idea of a shapely, heat-retaining form, mm. You know, even as the gods or nature or the soundless fields of time have made forms all across the soft, curved universe, I there's something in there. There's a reason that I wrote that down all those years ago. There's something in there that 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 resonated, mm. and I think, you know, what you just touched on a moment ago. The reason that I thought of the the the, the quote in that moment is you said it must be very comforting, mm. and I loved the I loved her word alleviating. Yeah. And the fact is that there's so, you know, I said earlier, we're living in this this cultural moment that feels, I think, for many of us, so uh, fractured. Um, and in, and for and from for many cases, you know, for many people, it it, it doesn't just feel; it is, in fact, violent. It is, in yeah. fact, um, you know, a moment that is where where uh, actual physical bodily harm is being inflicted on on folks. Um, and so this idea of, of, um, of moving toward something that feels elemental, that feels, uh, alleviating because it, because it reflects, yeah, you know, as you said earlier, sort of the natural order of things, I think is very healing, if I can say it that way. Uh, and I think that for, you know, for young people, especially who are coming of age, who are kind of figuring out the world at a moment where it's very clear that a lot of the grown-ups have lost the plot. Mm, <laughs> That's very, very, very damaging and stressful. Um, and so I think, you know, I don't, I don't want to also, you know, put too much, you know, I don't want to be overbearing about this either. You know, it's middle school. They got to show up to go to middle school and, you know, <laughs> do your homework. just the fact that we've organized the week in a cool way isn't going to take away the, the difficulty or the pain of being an adolescent in this culture right now. No, But I do think that there's something powerful about grounding work in a sense of rhythm and a sense of cadence to give kids a sense of comfort and safety in a world that doesn't always feel safe right now. Yeah. And, you know, here's the thing. I think um, one of the reasons why I like this model and, and think that I'll try to speak to it is that the the open explore and close that I I use as sort of like the creative gravity is is to try and get mm -hmm. people to understand that you must you must ship right this is we like as yeah. Steve Jobs yeah. said real artist ship Gordon. you have to, you can't yeah. do the you can't spend the whole time and then not perform the piece yeah the show the show must go on literally it's like you <laughs> have to it must you yeah know, it's like well there's an audience out there we sold tickets like. Yeah. You know, I know you're nervous, but we have to go do it. And I think there's this, this this time that comes where you go like, well, I'm I'm scared, but the work has to happen. And Mary Mary Oliver is clearly talking about. I love the stubborn stumps of shame. You know, that was right. that hit me hard. But you have to step over yeah. them and say, okay, well, what are we going to do? And right. the the what's interesting about your model is that it implies that we must plant we must harvest 
but then we have to rest. Right. And that's actually kind of sort of missing from the open explore and close creative model that I use because it's, um, mm. there isn't the, the drive is, well, let's close. Right. But then it's right. like, well, then what, right. then what do we do? It's like, Oh, well, let's celebrate mm. and then let's take a break and then let's open again. There's actually like right. a, a pause. And that's, that's one of the things that's come up for me in my research on conversation design is a conversation between two people is me taking something from inside of myself and trying to um, communicate it to another person in such a way that they bring it into themselves. Like that's, that's a conversation. Mm. If, mm. if I express mm. something in a way that you understand, you bring it inside, then you, 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 you bring it back out and then I bring it back in. That's the, the, the dialogue. Right. And um, mm. that conversation between two people is the same thing that happens. It's the same conversation that happens in a group of people. It's just more complicated. Right. Um, and that inside conversation for one person is the thing that I think is what's missing in most frameworks of, of work, which is how do I have a productive conversation with myself? How do I feed my own, yeah. my own humanity? And I'm curious mm. what you do for for your own winter, like for your own personal sure. winter to, to, to sort of replenish yeah. and, uh, and restore your own creativity, your own, sure. your own perspectives. Yeah. Well, I was, there are a few practices that I, that I, that I use. I think music is really important to me. Listening to music, live music is really important to me. So even just something like going to, going to see somebody, perform and allowing myself to just sit in that space and let that sound wash over me is really powerful. I love to sing. Uh, so singing is, is something that really helps me restore equilibrium. Mm. Um, even if it's just you know, singing to my kids, it doesn't have to be anything fancy. Yes, um, that's wonderful. And another thing that I do that I sort of stumbled on, but it's really become a, a touchstone practice for me. It seems a little bit goofy, but it really works for me. Um, is I so I have a dog and uh, I live by Fort Green Park. I love that park so much. So sometimes when I walk my dog, and when I say sometimes, I mean probably like two or three times a week I do this. I use the voice memo function on my phone, and I talk into it, kind of like a captain's log, I guess, like a recorded diary, and then I listen back to it. Um, and and it you know sometimes it's not it's not always very uh you know, inspiring it's sometimes it's literally just like I let myself vent I let myself offload I tell the story of my day or I get to know about something that's bothering me or I try to get uh, clear on on you know just something that that I can't quite seem to figure out in any other way. I just talk myself through it. Mm. Um, and sometimes I get, uh, you know, sometimes I get a little emotional and sometimes I get a lot of emotional, you know, it's just that sort of a space. And it's often, you know, we'll walk my dog at like 10 30 at night. So mm. it's dark. And if I have my headphones on, it just looks like I'm talking to a friend, so, <laughs> you know, I don't look like too much of a lunatic raving around the park. Um, but because, because it's sort of just me um, and I'm on the move and it's dark and the, there's sort of like a protective quality of being in that park. Uh, I kind of feel like I'm safe to just pour out, mm. you know, in a pretty unedited flow, whatever it is that's on my mind or on my heart that just feels like it needs to come through. And so there's that part of the process of pouring out. But then what's, what's really been interesting, and I just kind of, I didn't, none of this is planned. I just, it's just like been coping strategies hard to make school. So I'm like, yeah. <laughs> I like need to have some, some outlet or whatever. Um, but the, the listening back to it has been really interesting because then suddenly, uh, and, and that again is like kind of that winter space where I'm not doing anything. I'm just listening and receiving and, and, and I can kind of hear, I think I have, this is going to maybe sound a little corny, but I feel like when I'm listening back, I can hold compassion for myself in a way that, normally pretty hard i'm i'm a kind of a i'm a kind of a hard ass on myself sometimes in ways that are not very kind because i'm kind of a perfectionist and i like i want things to be a certain way and so when i fall short i get i get pissed at myself you know and so there's something about that practice of listening back where i almost am feeling like i'm the friend listening to another friend who's 
maybe struggling or having a tough time. And I, and I sit there and I listen and I'm like, Oh honey, <laughs> Like, yeah, that sounds really hard. <laughs> like, come here, let me give you, oh, girl, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yes. And that's not a space that I would normally otherwise inhabit for myself. So I don't know if that's, you know, I, I have no idea if anyone else would ever find that way yeah. of doing things useful. But it's been really sustaining for me. How much of a gap between the recording and the listening do you usually leave? Often it's right, you know, I'll listen to it right after I do it. So You know, sometimes I'll go back and listening to, you know, I, what's really crazy is that now there's an archive, right? Yes. So, and I started doing this right around, right around when we, um, it's been probably about two years. And so I have these recordings from back in the thick of, you know, writing the plans for the school and going through the authorization process. And it's just really, really, really intense and emotional, huge roller coaster. You know, this this uh, is and so very, very a grounding practice. This is totally normal, by the way. You're totally normal. You need someone to tell oh, you good. this. I mean this is like awesome. um this is like morning pages. <laughs> right? Morning pages is yeah, a classic yeah, yeah, self reflection yeah, sure, exercise. Sure. Sure. Um, sure. But you know it's so interesting in, in some of the other conversations I've been having a visual capture and visual thinking is a big part of, of my own work. And mm. when you write stuff down, when you, yeah. when you ask a team to record their conversations as they're doing them visually, mm. it creates mm. a diagram, mm. a document of, of their agreements and their process. Sure. And sure. what it does, uh, my conversation with, with Dave Gray, who's a total expert on this, he talks about mm. having like this, when you have a conversation with someone, the, the, the interface is air. And so there's, there's when, when, if I write down what I'm thinking and you write down what you're thinking and then we share it, now there's like four touch points. And what you're doing yeah. is you're creating this, this interface, you know, because you could just sit there and talk to yourself in the park, but by making the audio, you're able to pull it out and look in your mirror in a very different way. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's a really, <laughs> really cool process to do. And, and, you know, empathy with yourself is is really hard yeah it is oh such <laughs> a gross edge oh my god no it's it's, it's funny it's like it's almost like you would need to like take that recording and then like auto-tune it to so it sounds like a different person and then you could be like you know what? i know exactly what you need this you know because i yeah, can solve someone else's yeah. problems oh yeah in a heartbeat <laughs> i've directed whole life sit down pull up a chair i got you <laughs> That's just amazing. I think that's that's um, there's a, a an author I'm really hoping to get uh, at some point, uh, and I'll share this article with you. He, he was interviewed in the Atlantic. Mm. He talks about inner conversation, and they try to study it. Apparently, mm. it's a really hard thing to study because uh, obviously, when you ask people sort of to communicate what their internal dialogue or monologue is, it's really you're disrupting it. So it's hard to sure. it's hard to study. Yeah. But you have that's an amazing. Did you just how did you come to that? Did that something you yeah. just decided to do? Or did you steal that from someone? <laughs> yeah. Who did I steal? I mean, I steal, I steal everything from everyone. Yes. You know, so my friend Ilana uh, has studied with a woman named uh, Regina. I can't remember her last name. She goes by Mama Gina. Um, she does a lot of work around women and power and she's pretty, pretty remarkable um, writer and thinker. And, um, and she does a practice, um, I think it's called, yeah, it's called spring cleaning, um, where you work with somebody else and it's a really simple protocol, but one person's holding space, the other person is sort of the person in the hot seat, if you will. Um, and you come with a question or a topic that you want to spring clean on. And the person who's holding space, uh, just literally asks you over and over again, the same question, which is, so if I say, you know, uh, uh, whatever my topic is like uh the lesson planning i don't know that's a boring topic but let's just say like i'm really struggling with lesson planning so the person who's holding space says what do you have on lesson planning and you take one poll so a poll is just a, a thought like oh lesson planning is driving me freaking crazy like i can't figure out this da, 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 da. i get to the end of that thought i pause the person says thank you what do you have on lesson planning oh, well actually you know what it brings up this thing because like you know da, 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 da. and you take another poll and take a pause. The person says, thank you. What do you have on lesson planning? Well, actually, you know, now that I've calmed down a little bit, I'm kind of interested in this one particular angle that I hadn't really considered. So you kind of go back and forth um, in this in this way and you sort of set a time limit so it doesn't get to be an over, overwhelming thing. But because it's sort of structured in that way and there's no 
pressure to connect the poles. They can be as random as you want them to be. It allows you to kind of look at this thing from all these different angles. Um, and that person is just eliciting your thoughts mm. and your feelings. Um, and so it, by the end of it, it can be quite cathartic. Um, and I, and so Ilana and I had done that practice um, with one another um, a fair amount, but you know, life gets busy and it's not always possible to call up your friend. And so I think I, I think I started the voice memo thing as a way to sort of do that with myself. Mm. Um, even like cueing myself, you know, what do you have on blah, blah, blah. But it sort of evolved. I don't, I don't do the cues anymore. I don't ask the questions anymore. I just sort of trust myself that I'll start a thought and a thread and get to the end of it and I'll pause and then I'll let myself start in from a different angle. Mm. Um, so it's not always very linear. Yeah. I think that's how it started. Yeah. That's that's wonderful. Do you, is there a link you can share about that? Is there, does that exist anywhere on the, on the interwebs? I'm sure it is. Yeah. Uh, this woman, this woman's site is, um, mama Gina. I think it's just mama Gina.com. I haven't studied with her. Um, I've read a couple of her blog posts, but, uh, but yeah, I'm sure if you just looked for mama Gina spring clean, I'll take a look. I imagine you'd find. Yeah. So I'm wondering, one of the interesting things that I've been sort of looking at is when you think about designing conversations, there's like definitely issues of power and, yeah. you know, manipulation can even come into it. And yeah. an important question I've been asking from time to time is like, what conversations should you not design? Mm. I love that question. Yeah. Anytime you talk about design and framework, uh, there's an implicit question of who's initiating and who's, you know, who's, who, even even something that feels very value neutral, like holding space. You know, that person who's holding space is in a position of incredible power. Yeah. Um, yeah. For sure. And yet, and yet it's hard to know that a conversation will happen if somebody doesn't initiate it. Yeah. And then also it's the question of really what does it mean to design a conversation? I'm sure it's a question that you grapple with day in and day out. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, the idea of, I, I think what's tricky and what's the, the paradox that's sort of at the heart of, of the question for me is sort of the, the, the notion sometimes that we have that, that um, like, let's just let it flow. Like, let's just, let's just, you know, we'll just both show up and we'll just like see what happens, you know, but that feels like it's going to be really freeing. Um, and yet, and yet sometimes it, um, it can be very disorienting. And sometimes it's really helpful to have a touchstone or a framework or one person who's guiding. Um, and maybe, and maybe, the way to solve them for the hierarchy that that happens naturally when that when that dynamic is in play is to make an agreement ahead of time about not a shared leadership of the conversation but an alternating leadership of the conversation. I don't think that mm. you know I think it's very hard whether it's in a you know I'm actually thinking about even a romantic relationship you know it's not great if one person dominates the the you know, is, is the person who's responsible for initiating and dominating the sort of like the source of the romance at all times. And yet, if you kind of both try to be at the same level, 50, 50 split all the time, then there's no, there's no juice, right? There's yeah. no, there, there's no, um, there's no dance uh, because there must be kind of a push pull for movement, you know, for dynamic to, to flourish and happen. You know, yeah. that's a, it's a vibrant system. And so it needs movement and it needs imbalance so that you can come back into, you know, if that makes sense. And so I think it, there's a similar dynamic with conversation. So the idea of like, okay, let's remove hierarchy. Let's remove facilitation and just both show up 50, 50 and try to keep that in balance. I think that's quite hard mm. um, and maybe not natural. And so maybe the way to solve for it is in fact, to make an agreement ahead of time of like, I'm going to lead and then you're going to lead. Yeah. And then I'm going to lead, and then you're going to lead. Yeah. Um, that's probably not a perfect solution either. But then at least it's explicitly naming that that hierarchy can be in play, yeah. um, and bringing a little bit more awareness, a little more consciousness to it. Well, certainly the implication is like you definitely shouldn't design a conversation that um, 
in a way there's not to not to explicitly ask permission but but in a way to 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 get permission mm. to to bring in a new I, I definitely saw this in a recent workshop I, I attended and I, I brought in the sort of like Daniel ways of doing things. And <laughs> they're they're disorienting to some people who don't come from my world. Sure. And so in a way sure. it's like um I guess maybe like doctors or massage therapists do this now. It's like, so like, I'm going to work on your legs now. Like, you know, I'm going to turn you, mm-hmm. I'm going to turn you over if that's okay. Like, so in a, mm-hmm. <laughs> in a way it's mm-hmm. like, I definitely, what I'm hearing you say, and I, and I think I agree is that you should definitely not be the person who's always the designing the conversation and you should definitely not be right. designing them if you don't feel like you've obtained sufficient pos- permission to do so. Right. Cause right. it's like, who gave you the, the right to be the, um, the boss all the time. Right. Right. Absolutely. Yep. Although that's interesting too, because that can sometimes play into gender in really interesting ways. Oh, right. So if you're, you know, anyway, that's we could get down a rabbit hole there for sure. Yes, I'm gonna. But, I'm yeah, starting. I'm I gonna think, start a little side series on, on yeah. exploring gender and conversations because I don't know how awesome. to do that. Right? No, it's so important. Well, so look, so you know, I, we're coming towards the end of, of our time together. I'm wondering if there's anything I haven't asked you, uh, anything we haven't talked about that you think we should we should talk about. Mm. Well, one thing I'll say is that I am um, I'm grateful uh, for a chance to interact with the with, with your work and and you know in a lot of different ways. But um, one very concretely is I didn't know I'd, I'd heard. I'd heard the term agile mm. before um, and sort of heard it sort of tossed around in kind of, you know, amorphous ways, but I really, I didn't, I had never read the manifesto. I didn't know the sort of principles. Uh, and so that's been really, really fascinating for me to sort of take a deep dive into in the last couple of days, you know, as I was thinking about um, coming to this conversation. And I, I, that's, it, it's, it's something that's just, you know, new to me in terms of um, really looking at the history of kind of how that yeah. that, that framework evolved. Um, so, so that's something that I'm that I'm really interested in um, in terms of my own work and and where those principles come into play. Uh, I see that I see that that way of thinking um, very much alive in the work that's unfolding. You know, with the young people that we work with and the and the teachers in our space as we're kind of designing this community. Uh, so that's really, really exciting and interesting to me. Um, and it kind of brings me back to, to one of the questions that you've raised, um, you know, that you had emailed me about, uh, which is how is a school like a conversation? But I think it's just a generative conversation, just such a generative question. Um, and, you know, when I, when I think back about my own experience of, of schooling, it was like the app, the op- exact opposite of agile. Mm. <laughs> like it was just, yeah. it was a big concrete building that had people in it who uh, followed a very, very concrete script. And some of the content in that script was very interesting to me and some of it was not, but it was very clear that I had to move through this lockstep linear script in order to get to the end, at which point I would be presented with a diploma mm. and uh, you know, the opportunity to go on to another institution where I was going to do that again, I definitely in no way considered my experience of schooling to be anything like a conversation. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so one of the things that we think about a lot as we're uh, kind of ushering kids through the experience of being part of our, of our school, we're very aware that they're seeing the concept of school really kind of exploded. They're seeing the guts of this thing. They're seeing rather than, you know, a big concrete building, you know, even just physically, you know, we've had to move locations, we're in new schools, so we're uh, expanding one grade at a time each year. Uh, so, so even physically moving around, you know, we think a lot about what, what is the impact of that on our, on our community, on our kids, mercifully many of most of our families have, have, have followed us in the location. So that's great. It feels like <laughs> sort of proof of concept. Thank you. <laughs> um, but, but we think a lot about, okay, so what, what impact can that have on, on young people, and what I hope is that they will begin to engage with the concept of school less as a concrete box in which you go uh, through a lockstep series of, you know, learning events to get to the end and you get a gold star on your forehead, and much more <laughs> as, you know, being an active participant in a conversation where the grown-ups are 
you know, sure they're in charge and sure they're in a position of power, but they're also engaged in the creative process that is fluid and that is constantly iterating and evolving. Um, and so my hope is that uh, the experience, you know, and this isn't, we're not writing this into our lesson plan. This is a byproduct of the way that this is unfolding for our, our you know, inaugural classes. But my hope is that, that our kids do begin to engage with the concept of school as, as a conversation, um, as a way of, you know, being participants in this back and forth of what's inside of me, what's inside of you, how can we externalize those, those inner landscapes to the point Mm. where we can share them and learn from one another um, and begin to internalize what I can internalize a little bit of your internal landscape and make some of that familiar to me. Um, And I think that, you know, especially with kids who are coming from such different backgrounds um, and have such different cultural experiences and family lives and experience with schooling, that that, jumping off point is I hope really generative and I hope really valuable uh, for them. So I'm grateful to you for framing it in that way. It's definitely expanded my notion of of how we're approaching it. What is this thing we call school? What is this school that we do that we make, you know? Uh, It's it's a powerful way to frame it. That's awesome. I, you know, it's funny, often I'll sort of in the, in the sort of the, the frame of, of the, of these recordings, I often, We'll end the conversation and then have the sort of reflect and replenish afterwards. But I, I love that we're sort of doing yeah. a little bit of, of that now. I, I don't. It sounds like maybe you listened to the, the episode with Daniel Mezik. Um, if you haven't, I think you'd really enjoy I it. I will. He, no, I haven't. He, he uses, he talks about um, using open space, uh, circles like using uh, a very different sort of meeting to to bring agile, into organizations and. Alistair Coburn, who is one of the um, the Agile yeah. signatories and writers, like his model of of Agile is collaborate, deliver, or reflect, and improve, yep. and then and then it's a cyclical approach. and And I look at your right, diagram right. and his diagram, and I feel like they are very much. I think he would feel very at home in hmm. your in your school. Aww. And it's very interesting to think that we're we're sort of shifting how we. Um, think about educating people from a like w- what in the technology world we'd call a waterfall approach where okay here are all the things you need mm-hmm. to learn and here's the order in which you're going to learn them and like you said here's here's a gold star in your head here's a second gold star you've got five <laughs> gold stars yeah. now you get to go to the next thing to um right. this iterative approach that you're bringing to it but also right. that maybe the kids themselves will realize that it's not about g- being given the answers right it's right. about finding not even finding the answers, but just finding their own solution and being creative about that. Right. Making meaning. Yeah. Making yeah, their own exactly. meaning, which is really, really awesome. Yeah. It's really, really awesome. Yeah. Well, look, Kate, thank you so much for your time. This has really been a, a really enjoyable way to, to spend to spend an hour. <laughs> and it's it's nice to close yeah, a long a loop. I'm going to see Jim Chu this weekend. And I, this is yes! going to be, we're going to have a good long laugh about this. <laughs> <laughs> that somehow I, I love it. I found my way to to interact with his school like totally by accident, which is ridiculous. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so great. Great. Well, have an amazing rest of your uh, middle of the of the summer of the week and of the summer of the summer <laughs> and the winter of your winter. <laughs> Thank you. You too. The winter of my summer. <laughs> yes, the winter of your summer. <laughs> exactly. Um, great. Thank you so much, Kate. I appreciate it. Such a pleasure, Daniel. Thank you so much. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye now. And we're going to leave it right there. Thanks for sticking around. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe on iTunes or Google Play. Thanks for your fine attention, and I'll see you next time.